Hello everyone, myself Dr. Abhishek Kumar. Today's lecture that is lecture 25, we will be discussing about another important aspect. The term is called as paleoliquefaction. Paleoliquefaction is important because when we discussed about seismic hazard analysis, when we are interested to find out the possible level of ground shaking, the expected level of ground shaking or ground shaking which is indication of worst scenario possible because of so many sources in and, in and around of your site of interest, so many earthquakes which each of these sources have witnessed in the past and try to find out the possible level of ground shaking, we will realize that the important information about past earthquake it plays a very important role. That means, if we are having a complete information about each and every earthquake which has happened in the past on each and every seismic source or fault and same with respect to all sources which are likely to cause significant ground shaking at your site of interest. We will understand, we have also discussed when we were discussing about seismic hazard analysis that each of these information related to past earthquakes, past earthquake means the earthquake which have happened with respect to today which has happened or with respect to the time when we have tried or attempted for seismic hazard analysis. So, each of these earthquake information plays a very important role. Why it is important? Because whenever there is an earthquake, we have discussed earlier also that the earthquake occurrence is primarily related to building up of strain energy, which is also an indication of what kind of accumulation of strain energy over a period of time is happening. So, depending upon how much time and the rate at which the strain energy is getting accumulated, that will primarily indicate depending upon the magnitude of the earthquake, how much time it will take to rupture. If the rate of storage of strain energy is smaller, that may prolong a larger magnitude earthquake or greater magnitude earthquake. That is why we also interpret the occurrence of earthquake in the manner that larger is the magnitude of the earthquake more time will be required for the building up of strain energy on that particular fault plane. Once the energy reaches to particular level, which can be also correlated with respect to seismic moment and seismic energy, then the earthquake will happen, the material will undergo failures in terms of rupture, in terms of melting, in terms of generation of waves. So, if we discuss about earthquake occurrence, with respect to the seismicity of a particular region or a particular fault, these two important things are very important when we are interested to find the seismic hazard. So, one is going to give you what a particular source is capable of, that means the magnitude of the earthquake which is known to us. The second information is not only one magnitude which is going to give me clear indication about different magnitude of the earthquakes which are possible to occur on a particular source zone or on a particular fault. So, in order to have more and more accurate information about the seismic activity or how frequently different magnitude of the earthquakes are possible on each of these faults, subsequently this observation will be also applicable to all the faults which are available in your seismotectonic region. As far as the earthquake recording is concerned, we know that the recording of earthquake primarily in this part of the world has started in last 45, 50 years. However, the occurrence of earthquake, if we take into account important valleys, important mountains in this particular region, we can say that the dominating mechanism, whether you talk about convergent boundaries present in the Himalayas or in the Indo-Burmese subduction zone, the governing processes which are responsible for these hilly terrains has been happening since millions of years. So, on one side we are having information about earthquake occurrence in terms of ground motion record for last 40 years, 50 years and on the other side the governing tectonics has been prevailing for more than few millions of years. Of course, we cannot have complete information about all the earthquakes which has been happening for several thousands of years, but on the contrary we will also cannot deny the fact that more and more information about different earthquakes which have happened in the past that will give you more confidence about 
how on a particular fault a different magnitude of earthquake is likely to occur because if it has experienced a number of earthquakes in the past then accordingly we can also try to understand what will be the frequency of different magnitude earthquakes to get repeated in the near future. When we say near future mostly depending upon the type of structure we are dealing with we will take into account the design life of the structure which can be 35 years, 50 years, 100 years. So, we will be interested to know if a fault has produced m magnitude of 5 earthquakes in last 250 years then accordingly what will the frequency of these magnitude earthquakes starting with 5 to m value which is likely to happen in near future primarily we will be focusing on the design life of the structure. So, overall if we, if we look into the, the topic which we are going to discuss today paleo liquefaction we are interested more about paleo earthquakes or the earthquakes which have happened in historic and prehistoric times such that there was no information in terms of intensities because if we discuss about the origin of intensity scales it will go to last maybe 100, 150 years. If you talk about recording it will last for maybe 50 to 80 years, but if you take about earthquake occurrence that too primarily we are discussing about large to major to great earthquakes where sometimes the occurrence of earthquake or the return period of an earthquake is in the order of 500 years, 1000 years, 10000 years. Certainly the known information in terms of whether intensity map, whether in terms of recordings will not be sufficient. Once it is not sufficient definitely there will be lot of uncertainty related to predicted ground shaking or predicted seismic hazard value. So, in order to get more and more confidence we have to have more and more information about historic earthquakes. When we are discussing about the faults characteristics of the fault we also discussed that the identification of faults in a particular region primarily because of movement of the sediments because of unconformities because of, because of abrupt change in the sediment layers because of sudden shift in the alignment of the river because of sudden jump in the course of the river because of offset present in the ridges. So, these are indication of faults, but in order to identify a particular fault in a particular region that is a continuous process. The process never ends so it keeps on happening because the geomorphology of the region the tectonics of the region is continuously undergoing evolution. So, same with respect to paleo earthquakes we will never have complete information, but more and more information will give us more and more confidence in terms of whatever predictions we are going to do for seismic hazard analysis. So, paleo liquefaction mainly will be focusing on historic earthquakes in terms of some features which has been generated which, which were created by these earthquakes when these happened maybe 400, 500, 700 years back. 2000 years back if those features remain intact. Many a times these features were created by these earthquakes, but because of disturbances maybe for the construction activity because laying of roads or for other activities if that particular feature undergoes disturbance certainly we are losing that particular feature which was important as far as understanding of particular earthquake understanding of the seismicity of the region is concerned. So, searching for these features on the ground surface by means of available seismic atlas map then going for detailed investigation at the site in addition to when we are going for identification of the faults we can also carry out detailed investigation pertaining to identification of historic earthquakes which means you are also looking for features which were created during historic earthquakes or which were possibly created during historic earthquakes. If you can study those features you can also try finding out when these features were created, what likely was the magnitude of the earthquake and so on and so forth. So, here are the outlines of the uh, today's lecture that is lecture 25, we will be discussing about what is paleo seismology then we will also discuss about how one can determine the magnitude of paleo earthquakes, then what are paleo liquefaction, 
then development of liquefaction features because these features have already been developed at a particular site majority of the time not at the ground surface also, but beneath the ground surface. So, how you can identify such features, how you can interpret such features, then categorization of liquefaction features, how you can categorize different different features. Next one is conditions which can influence the formation of liquefaction features, then identification of such features on the ground surface when we are going for detailed investigation that we will we'll, we'll talk about. Possible features which we will be hearing about which are more common are sand blows, sand dikes and deformation structure which are likely to be witnessed within the liquefied layers. And then we will also discuss about some of the numerical problems which are related to paleo earthquakes which can help in understanding primarily the magnitude of the earthquake, the location of the earthquake as well as likely the time on which that particular earthquake has happened. So, let us talk about paleo seismology. Paleo is derived from Greek term that is paleoilois. So, paleoilois which means old or ancient and then so paleo seismology is the study of prehistoric earthquakes. When I am referring to prehistoric earthquakes, primarily I am also referring to earthquakes which are before the recording and before MMI values or where the intensity maps were developed taking into account the kind of shaking which was witnessed by people living in the affected areas. Remember when we are discussing about intensity maps, we also took into account depending upon the level of intensity there will be associated ground witness or there will be associated ground experience which will be experienced by the particular person which can start from minor shaking to throwing off cutlery or falling off objects and then flowing off objects into the air. So, each of these features which had been witnessed during different earthquakes and were witnessed by different people. So, now if you go and interview those people, they can tell you what features they had experienced during those particular earthquakes. This method of understanding the damage characteristics of the earthquake is important as far as the, the damaging characteristics of the earthquake is concerned. Sim similarly, it also gives you an understanding about the expected level of ground shaking which was experienced during those historic earthquakes in the absence of ground motion recording stations. So, before so, when we talk about prehistoric earthquake, primarily I am talking about those earthquakes which are for which directly the MMI scale or intensity maps are not available and certainly ground motion records are not available, actual ground motion records are not available. So, paleo seismology is the study of prehistoric earthquakes, specially in finding out the location of those earthquakes, where the earthquakes or primarily the epicenter of the earthquake was located. Secondly, about the timing of course, when we discuss about the timing, there will be some uncertainty with respect to the occurrence of those earthquakes. And the last one is the size of the earthquake. So, if you take into account these three parameters collectively that is the location, timing and the size, it is going to tell you when the earthquake has happened, how big was the earthquake and where it had happened. So, if for each paleo seismic observation, if you are able to get one one event, you can understand there will be significant change in your understanding about the seismicity of the region. If you talk about northeastern India, there are many such studies which have happened in the past, which have identified lot of prehistoric earthquakes or paleo earthquakes, which have been happen, which have happened maybe 700 years back, 1000 years back and more than that. So, if you take those earthquakes and compare with the catalog of earthquake, which was prepared before these earthquake information was known, you can observe there, there is a significant change in terms of seismic activity or if you take two catalogs, one is the earthquake catalog which was without paleo earthquake information and another one is with recent earth paleo earthquake information and use both the catalogs in seismic hazard analysis, you will see significant change in terms of expected level of ground shaking at the site of interest, particularly in northeastern part of India.
So, when we discussing about paleo seismology or paleo earthquake, the primary objective is to find out the location of those earthquakes, timing when it has happened. Now, generally timing means because we are talking about earthquakes based on some features. So, mostly we will be going with some indirect measurements of assessing the relative age of those features. So, there will be some uncertainty with respect to the relative age. And then last one is the size of the earthquake based on the features as preserved in geological record. This improves us in developing our understanding or improving our understanding in terms of long term behavior, how a particular fault, how a series of faults have responded over a long period of time in terms of repetition of different magnitude earthquakes. And of course, this is collectively going to affect the seismicity of the region. If you are going to construct a very important structure, definitely the inputs you are getting from paleo seismology will be very helpful, because these are going to give you more important inputs about primarily about major to great earthquakes. Because if you talk about the return period, the major to great earthquake will have significantly longer return period, where if you take only the recorded earthquake catalog, many of the important earthquake would have been missed. So, paleo earthquakes are going to give really very important inputs in terms of completion of earthquake catalog, subsequently in determination of accurate seismic activity parameters and later on in terms of determination of accurate value of seismic hazard level. So, the application paleo seismology is useful especially in the regions where strain rates are relatively low. So, that's, that means when we are talking about repetition of earthquake, the repetition of major to great earthquake is taking really, really long time such that it is almost impossible to understand the repetition or the return period of major to great earthquakes taken into account the current information about the earthquake which has happened in since the recording has started. So, everything will accumulate in terms of recurrence time, how frequently a, a particular magnitude earthquake is repeating itself in terms of occurrence of earthquake with respect to the fault. So, recurrence time of larger earthquakes, major great earthquake will be significantly high in comparison to minor earthquake or moderate earthquakes. In such regions, where the rate of strain accumulation is relatively low, the seismic catalog is often insufficient to characterize expected seismicity and return period of larger earthquakes. So, you are talking about larger earthquake, great earthquakes. If you do not take the inputs from paleo earthquake, mostly it will end up in underestimating the seismic activity of the region. So, investigation of paleo earthquake. Uh, so, generally when we talk about investigation, we are basically looking for the evidences which have been created by past earthquakes. These evidences means, evidences means something which because of the virtue of loading condition by virtue of seismic wave which were created by these earthquakes, when these waves interacted with the medium, this medium can be at the source, this medium can be between the source and the site that is propagation path medium or at a particular site. The expected evidences can be in terms of long deformation of ground surface along the crustal fault. These include fault scarps. So, fault scarp you can see it is a visible evidence of possible movement which is happening along a particular fault or lateral offset which we had discussed earlier also in terms of offset for uh, ridges in terms of triangulation facets which are also indication of fault movement. So, in just like these features, because whatever features I have just told these are surface features, not every time an earthquake induced deformation will be visible onto the ground surface. So, we have to also seek for some features which are not available only at the ground surface, but at later stage that means beneath the ground surface. Similarly, in terms of stratigraphic or geomorphic effects of strong ground shaking which can be witnessed near the site or away from your epicenter. Near the site means again you can have some kind of unconformity away from the site many a times you will have features like generated during liquefaction features generated during landslide. So, once these features have been created at a particular site over the period of time you will see whatever features was created 
may be some portion of those features were then over that there will be deposition of subsequent layers and these features will remain intact. So, in paleo seismology we will be searching for these features which are primarily available beneath the ground surface and then by analyzing these features we will try to understand what seismic scenario in terms of location, in terms of size, in terms of timing of occurrence which has been which, which resulted in these features. Of course, when we get a sample we have to also analyze the sample in order to mark approximately what is the date in which the sample was preserved at that particular site. Most often we will be talking about if there is organic material we will be talking about radiocarbon dating. If there is inorganic material we can also talk about optically stimulated illuminescence and then other method is cosmogenic nuclei dating. I will not be discussing about these methods this is primarily to give you an indication about what are the methods which can be adopted because going with these methods again each of these methods interpretation that will take many more terms which are not directly related to this particular course. So, I will restrict myself and my discussion with respect to just naming these methods which can be used in order to find out the exact date of the feature when these features were created and were conserved at that particular location. So, depending upon whatever is the material involved you can have different methods which can be used for the dating depending upon whether it is organic, whether it is composed of uh, minerals, whether it is composed of inorganic material or depending upon the limitation of each of these methods and relative standard error which these methods will give in terms of determining the approximate of the feature which has been created by uh, the earthquakes. So, as far as considering the determination of magnitude of paleo earthquake, we discussed about whenever these features are created on the ground surface that is by virtue of the deformation which is primarily an indication of earthquake occurrence or possible movement along the fault which is also subsequently an indication of occurrence of earthquake there will be some feature which will be created on the surface. So, if we know approximate size of the surface rupture length we can determine the magnitude of the earthquake. SRL in this particular slide it is giving as surface rupture length in kilometer. So, Wells and Coppersmith correlation 1994 you can use this correlation to determine the magnitude of the earthquake as far as you know the surface rupture length which is given as m equals to a plus b times log of SRL that is surface rupture length in kilometer. So, if you know surface rupture length and also you take into account the fault mechanism that is whether it is strike slip fault, whether it is reverse fault, it is normal fault you can pick up each of these features and then pick up the value of correlation coefficient that is a and b and the standard error corresponding to that you can find out how much will be the value of the magnitude of the earthquake which has actually created this kind of surface rupture length. So, that means some features which has occurred in the past resulted in the formation of surface rupture feature or you can say offset which has been created on the ground surface parallel to the ground surface. Just taking that length into account approximated with respect to the surface rupture length if that is available to you some minimum value of magnitude because if there has been some disturbance with respect to the surface rupture length because of weathering agency because of man made activities. So, you may have maximum the value of surface rupture length which was created or some value which is lesser than that. So, minimum value of magnitude of the earthquake which was created by this particular surface rupture length you can estimate. Now, one question may arise that I do have no idea about what kind of fault mechanism it has created. So, we can take the last one that is independent of the fault mechanism whether it was strike slip reverse or normal faulting if I do not know I can take the last correlation that is applicable for all type of fault mechanism and take the value of a and b and it is also given the magnitude range as well as length and width range. So, we do not know whether which is available on the surface is surface rupture length or surface rupture width that you can take into account here 
and then determine the value of the magnitude of the earthquake. Good part here is you have to only seek on the ground surface what are the features which are possibly an indication of surface rupture length. Measure those features and try determining approximately the length of the earthquake, magnitude of the earthquake which actually resulted in these kinds of features. Similarly, in terms of magnitude, in terms of so last one was if on the ground surface there is some kind of surface rupture which has been elevated or which has been witnessed on the ground surface or it has been raised along the ground surface. Second one is if you are having an exact value of offset or the deformation by which one part of the fault or one part of the ground has been raised with respect to its original ground that will be determined as maximum displacement or average displacement also can be determined if it is too much of variation in the displacement values. So, you can see over here maximum displacement, average displacement, strike slip fault and reverse fault, normal fault. Then these are the additional equations which are given if you know the value of surface displacement or offset, fault offset if it is known to you, you can pick up the value. So, a m value with respect to m d, m d is maximum displacement. If you have the value of maximum displacement which was created on the ground surface you can use this and corresponding to the likely to be the beach wall solution or likely to be the fault plane solution of your earthquake event, you can pick up the value of A and B and determine the value of magnitude of the earthquake. So, this is again helping you in understanding what kind of feature which was created at the surface in terms of whether in terms of surface rupture length or in terms of fault offset both these features are going to give you an indication about what is the magnitude of the earthquake which has resulted in these features. Similarly, if you have maximum, if you are interested to know the maximum displacement which can be created by a particular magnitude earthquake, you can go with the second equation and try determining what will be the magnitude of the earthquake. So, this is if you are interested to find out the magnitude of the earthquake and the surface rupture offset is known. The second equation is if you are knowing the magnitude of the earthquake as we, we know in uh, today's term that the recent earthquake is there, then we can determine what will be the maximum displacement this particular earthquake has created on the fault plane or even at the ground surface. The last one is if there is too much of undulation, you can find out average displacement and again correlate with respect to the magnitude of the earthquake or and vice versa. So, if the magnitude of the earthquake is there, you can calculate the average displacement. If average displacement is there, you can cal calculate the magnitude of the earthquake responsible for these displacement values. Depending upon whether it is strike slip faulting, reverse faulting, normal faulting, each of these correlations are having different values of correlation coefficients. So, you can use this correlation back and forth, both you can use this particular correlation and try finding out whether it is maximum magnitude maximum displacement, average displacement. Now, we are coming to, so, so it is like based on the features which have been created at the surface, we can determine the magnitude of the earthquake. These magnitude can be because of historic earthquake, recent earthquakes also. Since the fault offset, rupture surface length, if it is been safe in the current times also with respect to when the earthquake has happened like over a period of maybe 700, 800 years you can take approximately these value and try determining what will the magnitude of the earthquake. So, this is about the paleo earthquake means you are discussing about historic earthquake in terms of some manifestation, some evidences, some deformation which has actually generated on the ground surface maybe several hundred or thousand years back. Paleo liquefaction unlike the previous features which were actually surface generated features. Paleo liquefaction. So, again here the objective remains to find out more information about historic earthquakes in terms of magnitude, in terms of time, in terms of size of the earthquake or location of the earthquake. So, paleo liquefaction features is basically resulted in searching for liquefaction features which were not created recently, but during paleo earthquake. So, some features which were created during historic earthquakes and these historic earthquakes not only created 
surface manifestations or need not create surface manifestation, but certainly created or triggered liquefaction at certain layer within the soil. So, if you are talking about surface layer and n number of layers are there beneath the ground surface in some soil layer provided the favorable condition for liquefaction were there that means ground water table was higher the soil is potentially liquefiable and there was the situation was created such that during earthquake loading condition there was development of pore water pressure which subsequently tried to dissipate by creation of channels through which the pore pressure generated was trying to dissipate. So, when we talk about paleo liquefaction features we are basically interested in finding out the features indication of possible liquefaction which were created during historic earthquakes. As the name suggests because these are paleo liquefaction features many a times you will see like some earthquake has happened even in recent time when there is an earthquake and some liquefaction feature is created by that particular earthquake you will see some kind of sand blows available on the ground surface which suggests you possible location through which the water is oozing out and then getting spread on the ground surface. But if such features like sand blows have been created 100 years back, 500, 700, 1000 years back certainly most of the time these features will be disturbed by, by means of weathering agency, it will be disturbed by means of man made activities. So, we have to search for these features not only at the ground surface, but beneath the ground surface as well. So, we will try to search for location which are possible indication of deformation, triangular facet, offsets which are giving even based on the surface manifestation an indication that the geomorphology the tectonic setting is not as stable it, it is quite active and then we will try searching for surface features like sand blows or any other feature which is also indication of that there has been earthquakes in the past then we will try to find out these features. So, certainly along the uh, uh, some river along some water bodies where you can actually see lot of stratifications along the bank of these rivers or streams actually visible there sometimes you will be able to track for these features which have been created during historic earthquakes. So, you will see some features which are primarily indication of the movement of soil mixed with water moved because of excessive pore pressure development from some particular layer beneath the ground surface towards the ground surface as a result of dissipation of pore water pressure. So, paleo liquefaction features when we talk about paleo liquefaction it is an approach focus on primarily on soft sediment deformation structures and related ground failures. As I mentioned many a times it may be visible to the ground surface even at present, but at the same time many a times it will not be visible because of lot of disturbances created because of so many activities. But still if some exposed feature is there on the ground surface may be uh, for the construction of bricks if they are going for some kind of excavation you will see some stratification larger stratification is now exposed on the ground surface. So, if such features have been created along those particular stratification certainly you can see those same way walking along the coastal line walking along the shore of rivers or the bank of the rivers you will again see for these kinds of features that will directly give you a hint about that some features some earthquake which had actually created these features had happened in the past and at present there is no information about these features. So, that means you have to go for detailed investigation about these features. So, these are primarily the resultant of liquefaction features which were created by historic earthquakes. Even at present whenever you say liquefaction, so there will be development of pore water pressure in order to dissipate that pore water pressure the water along with soil particle will start moving towards the free surface. As a result if the potentially liquefiable soil is located at certain depth it will start for forming some channels through which this slurry can come onto the surface and start undergoing large movement spread. So, when we talk about paleo liquefaction features 
we are actually looking for the feature which are the channels which have been created within other layers which are primarily fine soils or the layers through which uh, relatively softer sediment through which the pore pressure dissipation had happened during those earthquakes. The systematic study of paleoliquefaction is a young discipline. So, we are seeing for last 40, 50 years there is lot of information related to or more emphasize about historic earthquakes and in terms of understanding the true seismicity and seismic hazard of a particular region, the understanding about historic earthquakes more and more accurately it is giving more and more confidence to expected level of ground shaking. So, it provides important information about the timing of the earthquake, the source area if you are able to locate the fault which is triggering the earthquake that means you are trying to find out the epicenter of the earthquake and then nearby if there are faults depending upon the fault plane solution of that particular fault you can even locate any historic earthquake to the associated fault. Magnitude of the earthquake, recurrence time if you are finding in last 50 years some earthquake is there and then that earthquake in last 700 years how many times it has occurred that is certainly give you an indication about what is the recurrence time or what is the minimum return period of that particular earthquake likely to occur on that particular fault. So, paleoliquefaction studies are especially useful in interplate and interplate regions where the seismogenic faults may not rupture the surface as I mentioned earlier also many a times these features will be visible on the ground surface. However, majority of the time these features will not be available on the ground surface. Primarily we are discussing about interplate and interplate earthquakes. We have already discussed about interplate and interplate earthquakes in previous slides, in previous lectures. So, it has been observed that whenever we are talking primarily about interplate and interplate earthquakes, surface features are not that common. So, we have to search for paleoliquefaction features or features of liquefaction which were generated during historic earthquakes. So, finding paleoliquefaction features can be difficult because later deposition some features has happened because of some feature was created by an earthquake 700 years back. After that because some feature was created on the ground surface there can be lot of disturbance because of construction of the road railway alignment because of excavation of the material for construction purposes, because of weathering, because of deposition and many more things which has happened in last several hundred years, two thousand years which will create lot of disturbance. So, many a times these features will be disturbed on the ground surface. Over that there will be deposition of subsequent sediments if the feature you are talking about several hundred to thousand years. So, there will be deposition of additional material on these features. So, feature was there one is the features can be removed by means of surface dis disturbance or otherwise these features can be buried by additional layers which are coming over that can be because of natural activity can be because of man made activity. You are removing soil from one particular side and start dumping over here then again these features can be found at shallow deeper depth. So, finding these features many a times will be difficult because these are not visible on the ground surface. You have to find out some indirect indication of seismic activity of that particular region such that this indicates you have to go for detailed investigation. So, thus these features, so you have to go many a times with respect to trenching, but they you dig out a trench within the ground surface and try finding out the stratification. You dig out a trench within the ground surface and then so this is your ground surface you start digging the trench once you start digging the trench you will see lot of stratifications are there because layers are not perfectly horizontal and within these features you will also find out some features which are possibly in indication of some movement which has happened in the past so, that means this was potentially liquefiable soil so, these are potentially liquefiable soil which had undergone liquefaction during historic earthquake as a result of which whatever pore pressure dissipation has happened that particular dissipation resulted in the formation of these channels and then started creating a deposition whether in this particular layer or even at the ground surface if you are talking about current times. 
So, we will be searching for these kinds of features when we are discussing about periodic fraction features and this trenching will help in understanding generally what is the characteristics of this particular stratification, which particular location of the trench these features you are finding. So, that you can interpret this feature and take it for record at later stage. So, understanding the paleoliquefaction features, development of liquefaction features as discussed earlier during strong ground shaking these can induce liquefaction and fluidization of water saturated loose sedi sandy sediments. So, sandy sediments which are in loose state which have a chance to undergo liquefaction and also because of water which is available over there when these are exposed to significant ground shaking there will be development of excess pore pressure. This excess pore pressure will dissipate by means of movement towards the drainage path and it can lead to formation of liquefaction features. As far as the dissipation of pore pressure is concerned, once it is done, subsequent flow of material that is loose and mixed with water, that movement will stop because the dissipation of pore pressure is completed. But during this particular flow, there will be formation of liquefaction features. So, these form a geological perspective. From a geological perspective, these kind of features indicate deformation of unconsolidated sand or that means relatively softer medium which triggered a wave kind of action during seismic loading. So, seismic shaking triggers regionally leading to extensive liquefaction and these can also result in the formation of sand dikes and sand blows. Sand blows often you will see on the ground surface, but if it was created during historic earthquake followed by subsequent layer of deposition you will again see sand blows also a subsurface feature. Additionally, dish structure, load cast, pseudo nodules, ball and plow structures these can also be formed in muddy and sandy sediments which are also an indication of some earthquake loading has, subje has been subjected to the stratification beneath the ground surface. Earthquake induced liquefaction features can be divided primarily into two categories that means first one is the feature which are related to deformation extending beyond, beyond the layers that liquefied. So, there were some layers which had undergone liquefaction, but these features have been extended beyond these particular layers including intrusive dikes, sills, diapers, extrusive sand blows and volcanoes. So, these are indication of some features which have actually been extended beyond the layers which had undergone liquefaction. Second one are the features which are related to deformation within the sedimentary layers. So, these are the feature which have been created within the sedimentary layer and are getting intact or indication of some kind of possible movement. These are disturbed bedding because of some movement from this particular layer you will have some disturbed beddings, dish structure, ball and pillow structure, load cast, related folds, pseudo nodules, convolute bedding and lamination holds related to slumping. So, condition influencing the formation of liquefaction features, earthquake induced liquefaction features commonly found in alluvial deposits, coastal, deltaic and lacustrine deposits of Holocene age. In this particular feature you will see sand is embedded within clay and silt primarily when we are talking about alluvial and lacustrine deposits. So, there will be a sand which is interbedded or sandwiched between silt and clay layers and there is also formation of presence of shallow ground water table. So, when these are subjected to earthquake induced loading and this has happened primarily during Holocene deposits or the deposits which have happened during 0.1 million years before present. Largely due to aging effect primarily due to Paleocene uh, sediments which is between 2.58 to point 0 by million years ago. These deposits tend to be less susceptible to liquefaction than Holocene deposits. So, that means again whenever liquefaction or earthquake related loading is triggered Holocene uh, sediment will undergo liquefaction. So, well rounded, well sorted, loose to moderately dense fine sand with high ground water table as well as low relative density 
and very high void ratio are susceptible to undergo liquefaction. These liquefaction susceptibility decrease with increase in fine content as we have discussed in the liquefaction uh, lectures. Layering in the sediment also plays an important role in the formation of liquefaction features. So, when there is layers of clay or sand silt, these form impermeable layers result in the formation of building up of pore water pressure in the underlying soil layer. As a result, this will be leading to formation of sand diapers or dikes, which are an indication of dissipation of pore water pressure towards shallower layer, even many a times punching through the clay layers. So, identification of liquefaction features, you can see over here potential photos of fault scar which are available or which are an indication of movement which has triggered the ground surface. Sand blows in second figure you can see, so that means these are particularly it is indicating a kind of hole through which the liquefied soil that means the loose sand mixed with water actually came onto the surface and started spreading. So, this is sand blows which, which has been witnessed during many of the recent earthquakes. Sand dikes you can see over here, so these are possible indication of some movement of soil layers which has actually been moved from shallower layer to from deeper layer to the shallower layer and getting deposited over here. So, these are sand dikes which are indication of possible movement or liquefaction feature which was created because of earthquake loading condition. Then many a times these features land you will see this particular soil has undergone liquefaction and fissures have also been created you can see there is no material which is supporting the material from beneath. You will see some kind of cracks even differential settlement on the ground surface. So, sand blows, sand blows result when water mixed with sediment went out at the ground surface at the time of an earthquake. Mixture of water, sand and silt can continue to flow to the surface for hours after earthquake till the shaking stop or till the excess pore pressure development has completely been dissipated. These are also called as sand volcanoes since these resemble simple small volcanic cones with craters at the surface that align with the ground fissure. So, you will see similar to volcanoes, these are small sand volcanoes where rather than lava the sand is coming onto the ground surface and getting created in the forms of con cones on the ground surface and craters are also been created. The opening at the ground surface that makes the path for slurry to come out, it is called as vent. So, it is the vent through which the materials come onto the ground surface and then getting deposited formation of crater can also be seen over there. So, sand blows are generally of two types linear, elliptical and circular depending upon the feature which has been created on the ground surface. Generally sand blows are thicker and coarser above the vent and thinner and fine away from the vent. So, as you are close to the vent you will see sand blows are relatively thicker, but as you move away depending upon what is the what is the pore pressure which was undergoing dissipation and what was the magnitude of the earthquake which triggered these kind of sand blows you can see large spread. Generally you will see the vent are thicker very close to the sand blows and as you move away it will be thinner. So, single event sand blows have more than one sand layers and are not capped by silt or clay. This is common occurrence in case of multiple earthquake sequence that forms a compound sand blows. When venting of sediment slurry becomes weaker with time, fine particles are deposited on the sandy units due to low flow velocity. The sand cones can be used as much as it can be as much as in meters as high and tons of matrix in width. The sediment that is left behind is called as clastic dikes. You can see over here. So, there was a layer in which ground water table is also present and the soil was loose relatively uh, relatively loose sand which is possible indication that if this particular soil is available on the ground surface it will undergo liquefaction, but by virtue of its position it is not be able to dissipate pore water pressure unless there is formation of sand dikes which are facilitating the dissipation of pore water pressure by movement of 
this particular material through clastic zones onto the ground surface. Once it reaches to the ground surface, you will see the deposition of these material through bands near the ground surface depending upon the strength of the earthquake and the duration you can see it will be deposited very close to the plastic zone or it will be deposited at larger distance. So, remember if you see this this is we are seeing in terms of sectional elevation if you see in plan you will actually see this particular sand blow will be looking like this it can be elliptical it can be circular also in the plan. So, taking that particular part also into account try finding out the average diameter of the sand blows again you can find out the magnitude of the earthquake as we will see in near slides. So, some of the examples in which the sand blows have been experienced during the past earthquakes including earthquakes in uh, New Zealand, United States, Italy, Japan, China. So, many of the earthquakes which actually triggered sand blows during different different earthquakes. Again there are some empirical correlations if you know the epicentral distance as we know you are moving away from the source the duration the the entry the amplitude of ground shaking will reduce depending upon the soil which is available at a particular site and the loading which is sustained at that particular site. So, one is going to give you the loading other one is going to give you how much resistance the soil is able to offer that will de define whether the soil at a particular site will undergo liquefaction or not. So, this particular feature which was proposed by Castella and Audmard in 2007 gives you a correlation between the magnitude of the earthquake and the epicentral distance in kilometer. This correlation was developed primarily for liquefied sites. So, if you know the magnitude of the earthquake you can find out up to what epicentral distance liquefaction is possible or if you know epicentral distance of a particular liquefied site based on this particular correlation you can develop how much is the magnitude of the earthquake. Similarly, if you know the diameter of the sand blows as I shown earlier also if you see in plan sand blows might be circular it can be of other dimensions also. So, you can find out approximately or equivalent diameter of the sand blows once you know that diameter you can also find out using this particular equation what is the epicentral distance of this particular sand blow with respect to the focus of the earthquake or with respect to the epicenter of the earthquake. So, you can find out basically the epicentral distance that means surface distance between the epicenter of the earthquake and where this particular sand blows of diameter d in meter has been created by an earthquake. So, if I am standing at one particular site having diameter d based on this equation I can find out this particular diameter of sand blows has been created by an earthquake which is created by which is which was created at re epicentral distance. So, if I am able to find out more than one features minimum three features of sand blows in a particular region and try taking this re value corresponding to each feature we can also locate the epicenter of that particular historic earthquake. So, that is how you can find out more than one more than three features you have to find out which are indication of sand blows, sand dikes and corresponding to those features if you are able to find out the epicentral distance keeping those features as center draw the circle wherever the circles from multiple features are coinciding with respect to each other that is possible indication of the epicenter of the earthquake. So, again you can see from this correlation nature of sand blow diameter and epicentral distance it follows a particular pattern which has been by Castilla and Audmard in 2007. Similarly, with respect to magnitude and epicentral distance as far as the earthquake led to liquefaction occurrence this is the photo which was in also proposed by Castella and Audmard in 2007. You can see over here there are features which are indication of liquefaction which has been created by different different earthquakes at different different epicentral distance. So, if you take overall if you know any particular magnitude of the earthquake we can give, have an idea about what epicentral distance like suppose you take 8 magnitude earthquake up to what epicentral distance this 8 magnitude earthquake can cause liquefaction. So, that means this is likely to cause liquefaction again depending upon what is the relative density of the soil available there what is the position of ground water table that will decide whether liquefaction will occur or not or which had occurred or not 
if you are able to find out the sand flows that will also confirm whether liquefaction has occurred during that particular loading condition or not. So, sand dikes, sand dikes are sheet like structures or tabular shape intrusive bodies that intersect the bedding in the host. These are well defined margins and can be distinguished from the host by means of differences in grain size and weathering characteristics. So, you can easily distinguish between which, which is sand dike and which is the other medium or the host medium. These are typically originated in sandy layers and are composed of sediment derived from source layer. These may contain glass that is little chunk of rock that form in the sedimentary rock often becomes narrower and more fine grained sections and sometimes branch upward. So, the sand diapers these are also additional features which are generally formed which means of piercing of mobile material into more brittle surrounding rocks. So, it will be some material which has been pushed forcefully into the brittle rocks by means of the development of excessive pore pressure. So, these are basically an indication of small intrusion of sediments into the rock medium which is primarily an indication of liquefied soil layer. So, these are formed due to liquefaction often result in mixing of different sand layers, sediment layers. The ri rising liquefied sand can be incorporate and mobilize material from different depths, bring it, it on together leading to mixing and intermingling of different kind of sediments. Let us see about some numerical problems, so that we will have more idea about how you solve a particular equation. Based on our understanding so far, we have understood that we will try to find out based on available maps, atlas map, even based on photo from remote sensing or aerial photograph, we will try to find out the features which are showing abrupt change in the geomorphology, where uh, presence of clip, then sudden offset in the ridge which is possible indication of faults. Then we will also go for additional feature which is primarily indication of fault offset, rupture surface uh, values. Thirdly, we will try to find out features which are actually stratified within the soil layers that is sand dikes, diapers, sand uh, blows and correcting those features, try analyzing those features indicating potentially when these features were formed or when these features were intact in that particular soil layer that is going to give you primarily what is the timeline as far as the location as well as size is concerned we will see some numerical problem. So, the first problem is the farthest liquefaction features during a particular earthquake is found at a 150 kilometer away from the epicenter. So, it is like we know the epicenter of the earthquake and we saw some feature which has been triggered during a particular earthquake which is potentially liquefiable features. In order to find out the maximum magnitude of the earthquake, the minimum magnitude of the earthquake, how to find out? So, based on the graph which we have seen couple of slides back where you can see on one side magnitude is there on other side epicentral distance is there. So, corresponding to 150 kilometer you draw a vertical line wherever it is touching the graph you can find out the magnitude of the earthquake. In this particular case it is 7.2. So, this is a another photo which is giving you a correlation between magnitude of the earthquake and epicentral distance to the farthest point of liquefied feature. So, corresponding to 150 kilometer you can find out how much will be the magnitude of the earthquake which has actually triggered this liquefaction feature. Second example is surface rupture land during two earthquakes are found to be 450 meter and 600 meter. So, these are the surface ruptures which has been generated or triggered during different earthquakes and in order to find out the magnitude of the earthquake again correlations have been discussed in earlier slides using this correlation and then surface rupture length you can find out the magnitude of each of these earthquakes. So, Wes and Coppersmith had given if you know the fault plane mechanism of this event you can pick up approximately some uh, you can pick up particular uh, correlation otherwise if it is not known you can pick up the generalized equation, use the value of a and b and try determining the magnitude of the earthquake. So, this is already given. So, one magnitude of the earthquake is 4.67 meter, other magnitude of the earthquake is 4.82. Since the correlation was given for moment magnitude, I am also adding up here mw value. Third numerical is surface rupture length of two earthquake events are 550 meter and 575 meters 
you can solve it yourself you will get more and more understanding about how you are determining the magnitude of the earthquake just because of these graphs which are available to you. Remember I am not going into determining the time of these earthquakes which is still an important part of dealing with paleo earthquakes. So, I am only locating with respect to the epicenter and magnitude of the earthquake. If for a one earthquake you have if based on timing you find out multiple features at different different locations which were created during relatively more or less same time using this approach you can find out the epicentral distance take those features at the center and draw circle corresponding to the epicentral distance where these multiple circles minimum of 3 are overlapping with respect to each other that will indicate possible epicenter of that particular earthquake. So, here two surface feature lengths are given the event has been further found to be produced by normal fault and strike slip fault. So, first one corresponding to normal second one corresponding to strike slip then again the magnitude is asked. So, because the fault plane solution is given you can pick up specific equation and try determining the magnitude of the earthquake as has been given over here. So, this is given over here you can again determine the magnitude of the earthquake here we have taken different different equations because one is for normal fault one is for strike slip fault. Another uh, numerical is average surface displacement a d value is given which is 30 centimeter and we have to find out the magnitude of the earthquake. It is also given that that particular earthquake was subjected to or the triggering mechanism was normal faulting. So, you can pick up corresponding to normal fault and corresponding to average displacement. Remember this is not giving you the maximum displacement. So, corresponding to average displacement whatever is the value of a and b coefficient pick up those values and try determining how much is the magnitude of that particular earthquake. Be careful with the units you have to use because not every time you will be using kilometers not every time you will be using centimeters. So, each of these equation have corresponding associated units which only you have to use otherwise you will end up in overestimating or underestimating the magnitude of triggering earthquake. The last one is if you have if you found out at a particular site what is the sand blow if you are able to find out sand blow measure the diameter of the sand blow. So, here it is given the diameter of the sand blow is 20 meter you have to find out the maximum minimum magnitude which is triggering that particular sand blows. So, based on Kessel and Odmerd 2007 we can find out corresponding to the diameter of the sand blows how much is the epicentral distance roughly and corresponding to this epicentral distance we have another plot which is giving you corresponding to liquefaction features what will be the magnitude of the earthquake and corresponding epicentral distance. So, from here you can find out the epicentral distance go to other slide you can find out the magnitude of the earthquake corresponding to this particular epicentral distance. So, corresponding to 50 kilometer whatever you are able to find out that is going to give you at 50 kilometer this particular magnitude earthquake has happened which triggered a sand blow of 20 meter diameter. So, this is this I hope the discussion which we have done so far it has given you an insight about what is the objective of paleoliquefaction features, what are paleoliquefaction features and how these features if you are able to locate in particular site you can take into account to understand more about the historical seismicity of a particular region. So, thank you everyone. Mm -hmm.